a very good morning once again bangalore continues to have wonderful weather and rains so those of you who are not in bangalore can feel jealous of the one and only city that i know which is air conditioned 12 months of the year and that makes us think of a lot of things it makes us introspect it makes us comment connect one thing which i wanted to tell you before i come to the main issue that is you know you know the topic today no that is uh, you know are married people more lonely and if so why what all these things we'll discuss the various thing right up to what can be the remedies of it you know because i don't like to just pose up a question or create some awareness and leave it like that i would like to give you some inputs on that i may not be a perfect expert but uh, i'm sure some inputs will help you and you can build on your own so let me start first with clarifying that being alone or being in solitude are definitely not loneliness in fact people who seek solitude and who enjoy solitude being alone being in their own company are people who will never succumb to loneliness that is one thing which i keep repeating and i am saying it once more to all of you that if you have the right self esteem if you have the right you know equation with yourself and if you can enjoy solitude and nowadays of course i have to put in that rider solitude without technology without gadgets spending a whole day with the mobile in your hand is not solitude it is not uh, being alone anyway so that was the first thing that i wanted to tell you that we do not have you know the concept of just because you are alone that is why you are uh, lonely please get that out of your uh, head what we want you to understand is that we are lonely from within us even if we are surrounded by people and that is the reason why i thought i will uh, talk to you specifically about marriage but we can extend it to family and all these things but i will start with marriage first okay now what happens is that there are so many marriages which take place in india even today even in the 21st century which are what we call as arranged marriage so you have this boy and you have this girl who get come together and they are going to spend the rest of their life uh, uh, together some of them do wonderfully well i am extremely happy with the idea that in india even though a boy and girl who just don't know each other they come together commit themselves for life and lead a wonderful harmonious and happy life together but in some others what happens is that there are some little little barriers they don't start on the right track they don't you know interact well and they don't make those extra efforts to understand either both of them or at least one of them even if one of them behaves like that then obviously any relationship has to be two way right isn't it now those of you who have done bcs or who have been part of uh, banjara will recall that i have listed out four pillars that make for a strong close relationship particularly a marriage relationship and the first one in that is communication okay the second is of course respect the third is trust and the fourth is commitment but let me go back to the first one how well you can communicate with each other in a marriage believe me whether it's an arranged marriage or a love marriage everything changes after marriage so please do not go by the type of communication you had the type of interactions you had the type of companionship you had before marriage it makes no difference people who have been dating for 5 years people who have been living together for 1 year once they get married the whole equation changes let us understand that in fact i personally believe that there are four types of human beings men women and of course the third gender also has to be included men women husbands and wives these are four distinct categories of people 
so when you see a man and or when you see a woman it is not the same as seeing a husband and a wife so what happens is some marriages start off very well with basic understanding and communication and they build that up so after the honeymoon phase is over i always tell that there is that phase which is the developmental phase of your marriage which is the phase where you make that effort to understand relate to communicate with understand and listen to your uh, uh, spouse people who do that will ensure that the rest of their life they have good communication they may have differences they may get into fights they may do all those things but they will not be lonely and define what is loneliness in marriage little later so if you have this thing where you put in that uh, effort and let me also clarify when i say communication i don't mean very mundane communication like you know did you see the news today so and so this has happened did you understand this political party or that did uh, are we going to that dinner uh, invitation by so and so that maid servant has not come uh, today you know we have to get the, the extra gas cylinder lot of communication like that may take place they may be constantly talking to each other but according to me that is not communication communication has to be when you express emotions your feelings so you start off with your partner in the developmental phase of the marriage by improving your emotional communication the more you can emote the more you can express what your emotions are even if it leads to disagreements even if it leads to fights even if one of them or both of them sulk after that even if they shout and scream at each other it does not matter because only through that process the communication builds the moment you start you know holding back what's the point in talking to her she will never listen to me what's the point in telling him something he will unnecessarily blow his top if either partner goes into that type of a thought process then you start getting isolated and then of course children come in children observe their parents very closely children do not listen to their parents but they are very good at mimicking their parents so if you have parents who are not communicating at the emotional level there is a great danger that the child will grow up not communicating at the emotional level and now we are creating an entire family of people who live as individual islands within the confines of the four walls of the house they are very much there they may be even eating and having meals together they may be sitting and watching tv together they may be entertaining guests uh, uh, together they may be talking a lot as i told you about mundane uh, routine day to day uh, uh, things all that goes on but slowly and surely they are moving away from each other emotionally and sometime or the other that leads to this concept of loneliness within a marriage a girl in a typical orthodox family leaves her parental home and goes to her in-laws home here again what happens let's say she has excellent relationship with her mother in law or father in law whoever it is so she feels very comfortable but if she makes a mistake of not communicating with her life partner then slowly what happens the significance of the other people be it the in laws or be it whoever it is it starts fading off your life starts becoming more and more dependent on your life partner and the, the equation that you have with him or her and that is when you realize that things are not going well the same thing happens to a lot of men men even today 
are basically cavemen. You know, in the good old days when human beings used to live in caves, a man who doesn't want to face outside pressure, who doesn't want to face nature or wild animals or other human beings, would run away into his cave and feel very secure and safe over there. Now, the same thing happens. Millions of years have gone past after the caveman till today. But the basic metabolism, the basic nature of a typical man remains the same. That whenever faced with an emotional situation, many, many men try to run away to their cave. Physically, they may be there. If something has to be done, somebody is sick, somebody has to be fed, child has to be sent to school, whatever other routine responsibilities are there, they will take. A lot of people take those responsibilities. But if they do not emote, and this happens more with men than with women, I'm not trying to be sexist or gender biased. It's just an observation that at least I see more women making that effort to communicate, to connect. But men tend to run away from that emotional connect. As I said, they will do anything else that has to be done, but they will not be willing to do. And that is the reason why I find, though you may not admit it, there are more lonely married men than there are lonely married women. Because women have that knack. They are more right-brained in general. They have the ability and the knack to find out how to overcome certain uh, things. But here what happens is that you start drifting away. The man keeps running away into his cave. The woman feels that, you know, no point in bringing up this issue because unnecessarily it will lead to an argument. He'll start shouting. We'll get into a very bad mood. So let it be. Children are around. In-laws are there or whatever uh, it is. Once that happens, Either the woman starts focusing on the other members of the family, particularly the children, and starts neglecting more and more. The man starts focusing on his work, on his friends, on his whatever other hobbies, and they start drifting further um, apart. So basically, while external factors like stress and this and that can play a role, but it is primarily your inner feelings what are your expectations, for example? Do you have unrealistic expectations from your uh, spouse? Do you feel vulnerable when an argument takes place or when you have to face difficult uh, you know, situations? And very, very, very often, by the time they hit what we call as the midlife, you find that the whole thing is developing a very strong crack and they have started moving into different uh, directions. Added to that is another very interesting factor that, as you're all aware, even people who are unhappy with their partners, in our culture at least, we do not run away from marriage. We do not talk about separation and divorce so easily. We have a lot of tolerance and women again have much, much higher tolerance than uh, men. The Indian woman, I always Define her as G-I-W, the great Indian woman, a phenomenon by itself. What do they do? They find that things are not going uh, uh, well. They are not happy. They are not emoting. They are not connecting. But they stay under the same roof. They continue to have that relationship, at least officially the rubber stamp relationship. And that is where the factor of uh, you know loneliness comes in. Similar is the case with people who love too much. There's a very nice book uh, called Women Who Love Too Much. If you really want to understand the mind of a woman, you know, who tolerates an unhappy marriage or a non-cooperative husband, you should read that uh, uh, book. So what happens is that regardless of the reciprocation that she is getting, she starts loving, caring, taking, you know, attention, doing everything, changing her own lifestyle and her timetable for the sake of her uh, spouse. What is she doing? She is, to use the old proverb, 
putting all her eggs in one basket. She says, this is the ideal man. This is the person I married. This is the person I'm committed to you for life. So anything and everything I do will be to please him, will be according to his needs. And then I will get a lot of love and affection and reciprocation. Unfortunately, very often that does not happen. The other person starts taking you for granted. It can be the role can be reversed across the genders also. Men who love too much, who are so crazy about their wife that they do not think of any other activity, any other relationship, anything else. They're all the time focusing on their wife. Either way, if you put all your eggs in one basket, you are a prime candidate sometime or the other to hit this thing called, you know, loneliness. There is one more factor which is a determinant of how connected you are and that is sense of humor. Check it out. If there is a couple who have a sense of humor between the two of them and sense of humor is not being satirical or not putting the other person down, not cracking jokes at the other person's expense, but being able to laugh at your own self. How stupid of me. Why did I do this? You know, when I did that, I felt so silly when I went and did this. Hey, you must be thinking what a stupid person I am. No, because I did this. This is what I mean by sense of humor. If a sense of humor exists, loneliness has no place. It's amazing, but you have to experience it and you have to observe it. And then only you will understand the significance. If the sense of humor is gone, it becomes a very dry relationship. As I said, you are only talking about what is necessary. What has to be done now? What is you know required for your day-to-day -day life? But you are not discussing emotional connect. Now, if and when such a thing happens, if you feel that that is what is happening with a couple or they are headed towards that, there are remedies. So I have made out a few points on how, you know, the the remedies to overcome this uh, marital uh, loneliness. And Anis has made them into very lovely slides with a lot of, uh, you know, interesting uh, uh, graphics in it. So let's go through that one by one quickly and then uh, we will discuss further. So here are the remedies for marital loneliness. The first one. Express emotions even if it leads to a fight. Don't hold back just because the partner will not agree. Keep talking, keep arguing, keep agreeing to disagree. The next one, respect the differences. You know that men and women are not just built different physically, they are also built different emotionally. Do you respect the fact that your partner is of the opposite gender and maybe having completely different way of thinking and emoting. Have a long-term perspective on marriage. We are heading towards a situation where many of you young people will easily live up to either 90 or even 100. And you marry at 20, 30, whatever it is, you've got a long way to go. Fill up the gap with friends. Don't put all your eggs in one basket, as I said. Spend time with other people, friends, cousins, relatives, whoever it may be. Disperse your uh, attention. LSE means low self-esteem. If you have low self-esteem, then you automatically become emotionally dependent. And emotional dependence can lead not only to disappointment and frustration, but will also increase your loneliness. So please check out and if necessary, work on your self-esteem. And you know, when you have this low self-esteem, a person says, I need your love. The person becomes an emotional beggar. When you become an emotional beggar to your spouse, you will never get received. You will only get charity. Remember that you will not get the type of attention, affection, which can fill in that gap of loneliness. Stop sympathizing with yourself. 
but live for yourself. Poor me, see, my spouse is doing this, my spouse is not paying attention, my spouse doesn't love me, etc. You go into that, you know, self-pity uh, mode. You'll go deeper and deeper. Instead of that, spend time for yourself. Do activities for yourself. Develop a hobby. Take some interest. Do some social work. If you feel like, take up some work outside uh, home. Take up activities which can be helpful to other people. It could be family members. It could be total strangers. Volunteering. What we do in Banjara through helping hand. A lot of volunteering really helps you to overcome loneliness. And then keep making future plans, both at the work level and also at the personal levels. As I said, you know, have that long insight where you start thinking beyond the mundane and the routine of today. Socialize more, have friends, relatives, whatever, you know, relatives. Take up some activities which are group uh, oriented. See how you can start or improve your career. Balance it. Work-life balance is very important. Don't try to overcome loneliness by getting becoming a workaholic and spending all your time at work. But see what you can do. Do something which is exciting, which also improves your social skills. And then learn to be alone. Don't fear being alone or being in solitude that it will create loneliness. It doesn't. The more you learn how to be alone, the less are the chances that you will get into loneliness. The mind and body are very closely connected to each other. So exercise, yoga, meditation, overall general caring of your uh, health automatically leads to a feeling of self-fulfillment and satisfaction. And then periodically make attempts to talk to your spouse, even if it is one way. Even if you find for any reason your spouse is not very communicative, let go sometime. Because if you talk every day and every time, the spouse is going to get even more withdrawn. But periodically, as I have written, Make those attempts to talk to the uh, spouse without putting pressure. Okay, I want to end up this slideshow by giving you five, you know, love languages. Which are the type of languages which can bring about harmony? First is words of affirmation, confirmation, appreciation. The other is physical touch between a husband and wife, non-sexual intimacy. Physically touching each other goes a long way in building and strengthening the uh, bond. The third one is what I refer to as quality time. Time spent on bonding, time spent on understanding, time spent on expressing your love and affection, not on Monday's matters, not on family, not on children and things like that. And acts of service and gifts unexpected very minor gifts it could be a flower it could be a loving note it could be a, a food item which the other person likes but that goes a long way in bonding these five love languages as i call them go a long way in helping you to bond better with your spouse okay now i have another thing dr dan kiley you know, wrote a very nice book. He smashed the myth that loneliness is based on being alone. He wrote this life-affirming book and program, which can help you to move away from blaming your partner towards loving yourself and recognizing your own inner uh, you know, abilities and your uh, capabilities. The name of this book, Anis is showing you the book. It is called living together feeling alone and the blurb says healing your hidden loneliness you may not even be aware it may be hidden from you that you are lonely sometime or the other if you still have the habit of reading 
please read the book. Otherwise, you can Google Dr. Dan Guidley. You will get a lot of information about it either way. But with different ways and means to help you to understand, to help you to introspect, to help you to believe that there are ways. Firstly, prevention. I started off with that. How do you ensure that you do not get uh, you know, lonely? The second is whenever you find that, yes, this loneliness is creeping on to me. I am part of a family. I'm a married person. I have a life partner. I have parents. I have children. I have in-laws, whoever it may be. But yet, like Dan Kiley says, living together, feeling alone. I may be talking to them, activities may be going on, guests may be coming and going, everybody may be going out for uh, picnics or whatever it is on a regular uh, uh, basis. But those things do not you know, take away uh, loneliness. That is very, very, very uh, important. And that is what we need to do. Since I was mentioning family, let me also tell you that while in Indian conditions and in our culture, we are supposed to be, you know, spending time with equally with all family members. We are supposed to be, you know, e uh, communicating and connecting to everybody who is there in the house and people who come home as guests or extended family and all that. Somehow, traditionally, it has been frowned if a husband and wife keep spending too much time with each other away from the rest of the family. It is not encouraged in a lot of traditional families. I don't know. I don't want to argue about their methodology or their reasoning. But I would say that your life partner is the most important person. When you are all of 80, 90 years old, not only your children would have grown up and gone away, even your grandchildren would be getting bigger and they would not be interested in you. The only person who can be your true companion, your emotional support is going to be your life partner. Ask anybody who has entered into old age and does not have the life partner, lost life partner, how they feel about it. You will understand. So remember that whatever else you do, you may be a very caring parent, you may be taking care of your parents because they are growing old. You may be having office responsibilities. You may be having a lot of things going on. But you cannot neglect the time spent, the attention given, the care, the love, the concern for your spouse. That is extremely important unless and until you make a resolution and I told you it does not have to be. Sometimes there are couples who stop spending too much time with each other because they are not being able to come into harmony. As I told you, differences taking place, arguments taking place. So they say, let me be away. No, it doesn't help. In the long run, it is going to lead to very negative effects. So agree to disagree. Continue to make efforts, even if it is one-sided. Please don't mind it because you are not doing it as a favor to your spouse. You are doing it as a favor to yourself because you do not want to feel lonely. You do not want to feel isolated and unloved and things like that. No, So that is the reason why I am exhorting you, even if it is one-sided, in the extreme case, do it. And sometime or the other, you will get that reciprocation. So with that message, can I take a break and hand you over for a minute to Sonal? who will give you some important announcements and I'll be back. Hello, everyone. Good morning, Saturday morning. And it's very interesting to hear different topics, lots of information, introspection, wonderful. It's very enriching, I feel. A weekend where you 
have so much to think about, so much to, um, you know, find places where you can also help someone. Wonderful. Okay, I, have, I want to tell you something today. Today evening, we are having inauguration of IPCAD, International Program in Child and Adolescent Development. I, you must be knowing that how excited I am. Because I feel when you are doing this kind of a course where we are trying to understand children and adolescents, because they are our next future. They are the next generation. And if we can understand them well, it's going to build our bond better. And what happens when the bond is built better? You start feeling, uh, being in their world. They also understand us in return. And especially in today's world where everything has become so organized, I would say overly systematic, everything is put into boxes and everything is equated to something. And when adults have partners, but in today's world, there are single children. Who is going to be there for them? Don't you think they may also step into loneliness? We never know, right? So can we give them that platform that I am there for you? And how you do that, you will know through the program. And if you want to know what is this program all about, you can ask for the link because we are having an online now. Uh, uh, session today evening as an inauguration and the phone numbers are given there. You can send your request for the link and join us today evening. Whether you join as a course uh, student or no, but at least join the link, you will know what we are speaking about IPCA. Yeah. See you in the evening. I'm back and I see a lot of interesting uh, comments and questions in the chat box. So let me start off. Anjali says, sometimes the person exists with such nature, which is loneliness. In spite of many good intervention, he or she may not like to come out of that. There are always reasons for it, Anjali. Supposing I have been let down by trusted people. I have given all my love and affection to somebody, but that somebody cheated me. I've had friends and I've invested in them. I've always been kind to them, but then they have, you know, let me down or uh, they have uh, gone behind me and uh, did things which made me very, very upset. And that is why I land up do, into that temperament as they uh, say, but it can be changed. If that person gets the right type of contacts, be patient, be slow, don't hurry that person, don't push that person, but gently keep making that person aware that I am your genuine friend, I care for you, I would like to have time with uh, uh, you, and you see that a change will come in. Okay, yeah, I've already seen that, the next one. Sujetna, no, Vinita says, I'm finding a very common issue among young couples that after a few months of their marriage, they're finding themselves left out or lonely, as you mentioned earlier, that basic ingredients of marriage, the four pillars have not been addressed and the consequences are evident. Yes, Vinita, I also agree. While it feels bad, I feel bad to label the youngsters and say that, you know, we didn't do this and you are doing it and all that, but it is a reality. I told you that after the honeymoon period of the marriage is over and you settle down into the you know routine life, that is the developmental phase of your marriage. Now, the issue that I keep coming across every now and then, not every, all young people, of course, but quite a few of them, is that that is the age at which they are also chasing their careers, both of them. And they are very keen to build up. They feel that this is the time and the age and the stage of life where the harder I work, the better I will be able to build up my uh, career, earn more money, get more 
respect and stability. And because of that, they are neglecting that first few years of the marriage, which is the developmental phase. And by the time they realize it, there is a child which has come in. And then we move into what we call as the child-centric phase, where both spouses now start focusing only on the child and not towards each other, thereby making it even worse. Sujatna says, leaving together, feeling alone. <laughs> Do you agree that one of the main reasons may be inferiority complex of a man? No, it may not be the main uh, reason, Sujatna. It could be one of the reasons, definitely. I don't deny uh, that. But there are people, uh, be it men, sometimes women also, I don't deny uh, that, who do go through these sort of uh, things. But like I showed you before the break, there are remedies. It is up to us to pursue them. Okay. Radha says, very good and interesting topic. Alisa enjoyed it. Remedies uh, were very apt. Quick question. Men becoming a caveman is also acceptable. They may be silent when normal, but how to communicate and put up with a husband who is physically and sexually abusive while under the influence of alcohol? If the wife is not cooperative, then they try to look out for it outside. Yes, Radha, I know. I have been dealing with such couples, unfortunately, more and more. And Bangalore, again, is one city where alcoholism is very, very rampant. We used to call it the garden city. Now people are calling it the pub uh, uh, city. One of our uh, team members, uh, Ram, whom we call as Humor Ram, he uh, uh, said in one of our gatherings that, uh, you know, Muhammad Rafi came back from heaven and uh, uh, came and visited uh, uh, Bangalore. And he immediately started singing his old song, Bar Bar Dekho, Hazar Bar Dekho. Because he said, Ke wherever I move around in Bangalore, I see only bars. I see thousands of bars and nothing uh, uh, else. So alcoholism is a major issue by itself. We need to discuss it separately. Now that you have told me, maybe I will take it up as a topic for one of our Saturday talks where we'll talk about the effects of alcoholism and what can be done um, about it, okay? Right. Vinita says, um, I also feel that some of them don't understand the term marriage. It's fixed with preconditions and all that. Yes, I agree with uh, uh, Vinita. That they are. And the fault lies not with the person, but with the elders, with the people who are mentoring this uh, um, person that you should, you know, we give so much training to our children, we put them through years and years of education, but does that also include training them to become a good spouse? No, it is required. Premarital counseling, training, mentoring should become a part and parcel of the preparation for marriage, at least in today's environment. Please take up the lead create awareness. We are there to follow it up. If you want us to do workshops and programs for the youngsters who are getting married, we are more than willing to do it. Yeah, Vijay Lakshmi says, if we start loving instead of arguing with each other, we will come to know more about the other, which will give us to know about each other very well. Exactly. I agree with you 100%. Make that little effort. It's not a give and take. It is not that, you know, I am always doing the talking. He doesn't talk or she doesn't reciprocate. Let's not make it into such a commercial uh, transaction. Sometimes it's good to keep uh, uh, saying whatever you want to, expressing yourself. Even if you feel that your partner does not reciprocate, does not appreciate. But you, the communication channel is open, no? Sometime or the other, you will get reciprocation. And in the mean, you will feel good that from my side, I am do doing whatever I can to maintain better uh, uh, communication. Pratik says, uh, Navin, oh, Navina uh, is here. Uh, suppose he had teenager son had to intervene in his parents' fight and later couple felt also bad for the child. How can the couple make up for that and make themselves come out of uh, uh, guilt? I always say, that in case you're having, there's nothing wrong in having fights. That's one thing which I want to make it very clear. In fact, that's the reason why I'm saying communicate even where you feel that it's going to lead to a disagreement or argument or a uh, fight. My only uh, request is 
please argue and fight on issues and not on personalities. I feel very bad if dinner is not ready when I come back hungry and tired from office. I feel bad that you come back from office and you are stuck to your phone or your other activities or to the children. You don't give me uh, the time. I need your time and I need your attention. So when it becomes issues, pointing out that this is what my need is, the argument can be very constructive. But if it becomes derogatory, you don't care for me. You don't even bother to cook for me on time. You don't bother to talk to me. You are always with your friends. Then it becomes bad. So if you can ensure that your discussions, your arguments are based on issues, sometime or the other, they start giving you results. And that is what the children also want to see. If children feel that it is an argument on issues, they will be very comfortable with it. Sureka says, couples often ignore each other's emotional needs out of mindlessness, which in turn leads to loneliness. Very true, Sureka. You have been seeing it as a counselor. I have been seeing uh, quite uh, this thing. In fact, you use the word mindlessness. You're all aware that there is a very large growing concept of mindfulness. And that's a wonderful tool. We had the privilege of an uh, Indian origin American who is with the University of California. Twice she had come to India and taken a workshop for our people, a six week uh, workshop on mindfulness. There are online programs also available. If you can learn that mindfulness, no, that's another great, uh, what do you say, vaccination against uh, loneliness. Ah. <sighs> Sneha says, how to overcome the emotional draining that happens after an argument from the partner who tries to make it the point to communicate. Yes, what I feel is you're having an argument and you realize that it is either mentally or physically sort of, you know, draining you uh, uh, out. If you feel uh, that way, take a break. Make some excuse saying that, oh, I had to make the purchase immediately or I had to make an urgent phone call or I have to go and see that father's medicine is given. Something like that. Take a break. Do not allow an argument or an unpleasant discussion to go on for a long length of time. And most importantly, do not allow it to go late into the night where you finally go to sleep feeling unpleasant. That has a very deep impact. So make sure that you take a break. Maybe even say something lightheartedly and laugh over uh, um, it. We had the great privilege uh, when I was in IIT Bombay of having two stalwarts from the RSS. One was the late Manohar Parikar, who became chief minister and then defense minister. The other is Sudhindra Kulkarni, who also became a Rajya Sabha member and who used to write... Uh, speeches for Atal Bihari Vajpayee and LK Advani and all that. Now, we used to be very strongly anti-RSS and they used to be very strongly pro-RSS and we would sit together and go on and on and on arguing and fighting. The wonderful thing is, one of the group would suddenly say, Are yaar, this is getting too bitter, yaar. It's going to put a strain. Come, I'm going to treat you guys for samosa and tea. Let's go. And that's it. We used to all be friends again. We used to laugh, joke. We used to say, you pay for the tea. I pay for the samosa or something like that. And we say, okay, we'll meet again some other time and we'll start fighting all over again. See how it can be done. It is possible. Between husband and wife also, it is uh, uh, possible. Right? <sighs> Pratima says, usually elders enter the argument between uh, couples and their son is always right, even though wrong. Isn't this pampering him in the wrong deeds, encouraging him to look down on his wife, disrespecting? Yes, unfortunately, some elders do it. And it's not restricted to sons. They can do it with daughters also. I do have I've come across cases where, you know, the uh, parents univocally take the side of their daughter and tell the son-in-law that everything that you are doing is wrong, everything that she is doing is right. But you, you are right, Pratima. There are more and more cases where you have them, you know, parents of the man 
trying to show that you know our son is always right and all that. But again, I say and I insist that if there is some sort of good communication and understanding other than fights, if there is some level of understanding and acceptance between husband and wife, no other person like parents or in-laws or anybody can actually destroy that. That is my firm belief. Only when you give you know, a gap between the two of you, if you're not sitting together and if you're creating a gap between the two of you, then between pati and patni, the woh comes in. The woh need not be another you know, affair or a romantic uh, partner. It can even be parents. When they come in and occupy that place, which should have been for, for the bonding of the husband and wife. So be aware whenever something like this happens, right? Vinita says, what do we suggest to young couples, especially when I don't see any major issues, but they just stick with their egos and not willing to give in? Yeah, when such a situation arises, what I do is I talk to them individually. If I talk to them together, it leads to a lot of bitterness sometimes. So I talk to them individually. So what this person says is, I am right, my spouse is wrong. I don't think I have to make any compromises. I don't think uh, I am doing anything wrong. So you better talk to my spouse and tell him or her to change methods. Okay, I tell them, fine. I will talk to your spouse. I will try. I will make that uh, attempt. If your spouse agrees to change, wonderful. But you know your spouse since a long time. You have been having these arguments and fights for a long time. You have tried various methods to change your spouse. You have not succeeded. Supposing you don't succeed. Supposing my efforts also don't succeed. Who is suffering? You are suffering. You are going through a bad time. Your life is becoming unpleasant. You are not being able to enjoy life. You are doing well at your work or taking care of your family. You are financially well off, your health is good, your other relationships are good, but you are still not basically happy because you are having this problem with your uh, partner. So, not as a charity to your partner, but as a gesture to your own self, are you willing to bring about some change? Instead of insisting that my partner is wrong. In a marriage, I always keep asking this very fundamental and basic question. Is it more important for you to be right or is it more important for you to be happy? Your happiness, not the happiness of your spouse. And that sometimes works, not always. Hmm. Surekha says, one of the hardest parts of life is deciding whether to walk away or fight harder. Yes, Rekha, but then there is a third option also. You don't walk away, you don't fight harder. You agree to disagree and you start investing more in other people and minimize these fights and these arguments and all that and say for various reasons. I know so many couples where practically it is not possible to walk away for various reasons. It doesn't matter. And you need not be fighting all the time. Once you realize that issues lead only to uh, fights, you can start making an effort to minimize them. I'm not saying you can eliminate them, but if you minimize them and put your emotional attention more towards other people, it could be a parent, it could be a child, it could be a best friend, it could be a pet dog. Start you know, investing your emotions in other people and that is where you will be able to lead a better quality of uh, life. Renu says we don't live with our parents our children for such a long time, but we live with our spouses for many, many more years. Yes, so definitely a lot of understanding is necessary. Sometimes every couple needs solitude. So it's nice to be alone than poking into each other's space. This is something which I always advocate. Once in a while, see if you can take a vacation, not together, but separately. You want to go alone, you go. You want to take your best friend and go. You want to take your sister or your you know, a mother or somebody with you, you take and go do whatever it is. But don't think that you have to be stuck to each other. Giving space is as important in marital relationship as giving good communication and connection. Keep that in mind and practice it. Help people to practice that. Particularly those who are all the time stuck to each other, right? So Chetna says remedies and five love language, as you mentioned, will be very useful for most of the couples. Thank you so much. 
for the topic and session. Thanks, Sujitna. Even if a few couples can pick up a few points and work on it, I am going to be very happy. I don't look at numbers, but a, a family, a couple, you know, leading a better quality of life is enough satisfaction for uh, uh, me. Okay, Pratik says, oh, sorry, Navina says, after an argument with my hubby, even though I feel bad, but then I sit with myself and try to calm myself, even cry it out, and then send loving vibes to my hubby. Also say in my mind that I forgive him and take forgiveness mentally. Excellent habit, Navina. I really hats off to you that you have that magnanimity that open-mindedness or broad-mindedness to do it. And as you can see, it is for your benefit, not for the benefit of your spouse. Anything like this. This is part of what I was mentioning earlier about mindfulness. Navina is practicing that and all of us can practice it whenever it is uh, needed. Okay, Krishnan says, what if spouse says I had enough? I want my life back. Can't be still serving other. I want to go alone and see my adventures. This though sometimes feel like relationship drain. Yes, it can. I, can, I agree with the, uh, you. But what you need to do in that case is give space. When at least one of the partners is feeling that claustrophobia, feeling that, no, I want some space, please do give it. I have seen couples who have kept away from each other for a trial period, who have been, you know, isolated and given space and they have got back together to a better quality of life. Try it out if it is uh, uh, needed. Ha, Nandita says, what if one spouse isn't willing to go for counseling and all the unpleasantness continues? Doesn't matter. I told you, no. If the spouse is not willing to come, let the aggrieved person go for counseling and work towards improvement of his or her quality of life. The counseling cannot help improve the relationship between the spouses, but the counseling can definitely help that person who is gone for counseling to improve quality of life, to spread out further. I already mentioned that, you know, try to not put all eggs in one basket, but try to, you know, look at other uh, situations and improve uh, that. Ah, Yashoda has made a very nice statement. I feel sometimes being lonely is also nice. I want you to just, you know, dwell on that word lonely. Loneliness can never be nice. Loneliness is a mental state where you feel that you have been rejected. You have been left alone. You have been sort of, you know, disappointed and let down. You have been isolated. Feeling level. Okay. So I just want to change that and say, being alone sometimes is nice. Being in solitude sometimes is not nice. Being lonely is not uh, nice. Archana says, I feel any relationship needs time and space, especially marriage. If you are impatient and imposing, then things go wrong. Yes, I agree with you. And this could be a wonderful message to the younger people. The people who are going to get married or people who have recently been married, they have to understand that unlike what is happening in the rest of the world and rest of the activities, there is no instant gratification in a marital relationship. It is not a pizza which you order and it has to come within the next 13 uh, minutes. It may take 13 years for you to build up a harmonious relationship, but I tell you it is worth all those 13 years. Renu says, minimum communication and quality time is more appreciated than spending more time with each other. Yes, you're absolutely right. It is what we call as quality time, which you mentioned. And I've always been a believer in that. That just spending time going on, making gossip, talking about some third persons and just, you know, having that. No, you think that, see, I've got such good communication with my spouse. We sit and talk for hours. You're fooling yourself. Quality time is what is uh, necessary at the emotional level. Surika says even not communicating is communicating exactly. I always say that, no, that the non-verbal communication is far more important than the verbal uh, uh, communication. 
Sometimes you can communicate through your eyes. Sometimes you can communicate with a smile. Sometimes you can communicate with any other uh, form. You don't have to use words. Sri Karan said, what to do when your spouse breaks your trust again and again? Yes. If the trust is being broken again and again, as you said, you need to introspect. You need to put in some sort of ultimatum and say that my tolerance level is going down. I am not able to accept it. Would you like to rethink over the whole thing? Otherwise, I don't think. Give sufficient notice and sufficient warning to the spouse and start making alternative plans. You cannot continue to live with somebody who is putting down your trust. Unless the putting down of the trust is happening only in particular areas, small areas, which you can neglect. You know, he or she is cheating you of some money and using of the money when you are you are supposed to be saving together. So small things can be tolerated, right? Yeah, Divya says, sometimes after an argument feels sad, sometimes whole day is ruined in that, uh, uh, is that healthy way? No, not at all, uh, uh, Divya. Because as I said, no, if the argument is on issues and not on persons, and if you are not hitting each other personally, then you can bounce back. And even then, if it is leaving you with some unpleasantness, seek somebody else's company who will be nice to you, who will give you positive strokes, who will appreciate you, who will love you and care for you. Spend some time with such a person. It could be a small child. It could be a friend. It could be anybody. And you will find that you are able to overcome that unpleasantness because of the argument that took place with your uh, spouse. Navina says, I feel every person and every situation teaches us something, including our spouse. Very true. So if we are able to see the brilliance, even in a fight, we would be able to shift the energy and vibes of the entire thing. Lot of people, I tell you, can learn a lot through arguments. When arguments take place, it is a process of trying to look for a solution. So don't be scared of arguments and uh, fights. As we were discussing just now that, you know, after a fight, if you're left with an uneasy or unpleasant feeling, focus on what you learned. Focus on what the other person said and what you said and where you can come either to a common ground or in the worst case, even come to a situation of agreeing to disagree. Even that can serve a lot of purpose. But I definitely feel that as long as there is quality time spent together, as long as there is a one-to-one -one communication at the emotional uh, level, you are vaccinating yourself against loneliness. And the rewards of that will come not now, but when you have grown older. And as I said, when your children and even maybe your grandchildren have grown up, and if you're lucky enough to have your spouse with uh, you in those sunset years, you will understand the value of what building that relationship is. There's a lot of uh, research which shows that other than the honeymoon phase where you're deeply in love and you feel that you're on the top of the world and over the moon, etc., it is the sunset years if you are lucky to have a spouse who understands you and who gives you that companionship. It cannot be replaced by anything. No children, grandchildren can give you the type of comfort and solace and uh, warmth which your own life partner of 30, 40, 50, 60 years can uh, give you. Aim towards that. Spread the message to people as much as possible. Thank you very much for the thank you messages that are coming that gives me a little boost and gives me that little positive feeling that, yes, I am on the right track and I keep looking for you know, different topics and different ways and means by which I not only can try and spread some message to you, but also to learn from you. And that is what we continue doing. And here you are at the end of the session as the clock strikes 12. Anis is announcing to you the next Saturday's program and topic, which is why children tell lies. So often we feel that, you know, why does my child tell lies? What is wrong with him? What did I do wrong in my upbringing? Let's have an open mind and discuss why children tell lies. 
which is on next Saturday at 11 o'clock. See you. Bye-bye. Have a nice weekend.